When Kate asked me to talk about my career, I wasn't quite sure what she had in mind. Uh, she wanted something that maybe was a little bit more interactive. Uh, and I apologize for not providing you that opportunity to, uh, uh, other than perhaps a few minutes at the end. Uh, as David mentioned, I had done something like this three years ago for the Kellogg lecture, but I, I wanted to update it for one thing and put a little bit more substance to the, some of the examples that I used for the research. But uh, it really is kind of a journey for me, you know, from when I started uh, in academia, uh, or with a serious academic interest anyway, in, uh, in graduate school. And uh, that particular theme that I uh, picked up early on, even as an undergraduate in anthropology, I believe has kind of carried through all of my research that I've done since then. So let me see, I'm, I'm mic'd for this uh, taping of this lecture. I don't, and of course, you don't know how technologically challenged I am. So let's see what happens here. Oops, it works. Okay. Well, so the journey began in anthropology. And this is really an interdisciplinary or a multidisciplinary journey. I wanted to share with you how I was able to carry out my research, even from the very early years, with the help of a lot of other people. And may, not just other colleagues in anthropology, but really other disciplines. How they were brought to bear at timely uh, periods in the research to be able to answer some of the questions that I had generated over the 40, 45 years or so. So it kind of starts with, uh, oops, started where I studied, I actually started studying anthropology as an undergraduate. I had an undergraduate degree in general anthropology, and then I went to Penn State uh, to do my graduate work. And it was there that uh, really my ideas started to formulate as to how I could study biological anthropology with living contemporary populations and put a, a human evolutionary spin on that. Also, it introduced me to uh, work in a less developed part of the world. It exposed me to field-based research, which I love to still to this day. I just wish I had the stamina to continue to do it. Uh, and it provided me a framework for understanding what I think now are very important life uh, changing issues associated with living in very poor countries. Uh, when I went to, to uh, Penn State as a graduate student, my uh, initial interest there was, of course, to study biological anthropology. And I wanted to study under Paul Baker, who was also, David didn't mention, was David's uh, major advisor as well at Penn State several years later, but nonetheless. Um, and I was uh, interested in morphological characteristics, how populations and individuals differed. And as Baker put in one of his publications, he wanted to be able to explain how human biological variation, which is you know, an incredible uh, feature of our species, how this might reflect how those individuals or those populations may have adapted to their environment. It's a pretty common kind of an evolutionary biology question. But Baker was applying it to, to humans. And in particular, he wanted to look at this in stressful environments. And he chose one particular stressful environment where I started my research, which was at extreme high altitudes in Peru. Um, the, uh, uh, research that I had done was really uh, developed with Baker, but also with a number of other people on the faculty and who were mentors to me. N they won't be known to many of you, people like Ed Hunt. Ellsworth Buzkirk might be known to some of you, uh, who is a physiologist, applied physiologist, Gabriel Escobar, and so on. Uh, and they really kind of launched me on this idea of how to study population variation in, in physiological and morphological characteristics and how this might confer some advantage in populations living in developing countries uh, or particularly in populations living under extremely stressful conditions. <clears throat> so uh, that started me and of course what I ended up doing is going to Peru and uh, you won't recognize these two individuals here but uh, <laughs> believe it or not <laughs> 
that was Machu Picchu before the hotels were built and everything else. But uh, it took me to some exotic places and I've continued to enjoy that through my entire career. It also took me to some three-star restaurants where I ate exotic food like guinea pig and, uh, and uh, somebody did comment on my wardrobe over there. Remember this is 1969, okay? <laughs> Also, I'm probably half the size that I am now. <coughs> but in this process of working in Peru, I was particularly interested in studying how individuals, in this case young children, adapted to high altitude and how high altitude affected their growth. And uh, so the functional outcome of their morphology was in somehow inferred in terms of how well, how this reflected how well they adapted to this very, very stressful environment at high altitude. Um, and I, that's what I did my dissertation on. Then I took my first job. After those days, anthropologists didn't do postdocs. So I went right to the University of Massachusetts and spent two years in the faculty there in the anthropology department. And it was at that point where I was continuing to, to develop some of the ideas I had put forth in my thesis, and particularly looking at pregnancy at high altitude and seeing how adaptations during pregnancy might confer advantages to certain individuals in terms of the outcome of the pregnancy. Uh, at that point, I was brought to Cornell by Mal Nesheim, who's in the audience. And it was uh, kind of a stroke of luck for me. I don't know if it was a stroke for, for if anything for the division over these years, but I certainly had the opportunity to implement the research that I wanted to do here that I probably couldn't have done at UMass. And I benefited from the vision of the formation of the Division of Nutritional Sciences back in 1974. I came in 75. This is a vision that I think uh, um, Richard Barnes, who was the Dean of the Graduate School of Nutrition before the Division of Nutritional Sciences formed, and Mal Nesheim, who was the first director, to implement this multidisciplinary unit to study nutrition and, and kind of break away from the traditional way nutrition departments around the country were formulated. And lo and behold, they actually thought they needed an anthropologist. So they ended up hiring me and it's been 40 years. <laughs> so <coughs> I don't know if they made a good choice, but I know I did. I, um, it also allowed me to continue to do my research on high altitude adaptation, even though there was not a lot of nutrition in it at the time. And Mal was very clear in our, my interview and, and subsequent uh, mentoring sessions that I didn't have to rush into becoming a card-carrying nutritionist. They wanted me to be a good anthropologist who, you, who studied nutrition. So the first discipline was anthropology. The second discipline was nutrition. All right. Now, at that time, uh, 1975, 1976, there were two very important publications came out. One was in the anthropology literature, and one was more in the nutrition literature. The one in anthropology was written by a, a, a physical anthropologist by the name of Richard Mazes, and he was uh, he was also a, a student of Paul Baker's for uh, part of his graduate career, and he was perplexed with this effort to try and understand how biological variation could be a reflection of adaptation to populations or individuals. How do you measure this? How do you measure whether there's an adaptation or not, a physical or physiological or morphological characteristic you measure? And he, he came up with a rather interesting way of, of looking at this. He says, look, an, what's an adaptation? An adaptation should be a benefit to the individual or to the population. Uh, now, if that's the case, then shouldn't you have some metric on which you can measure these benefits? So he came up with this publication, which was uh, really an important publication for me, where he identified what he called adaptive domains, places where you can measure benefits in individuals and populations as a function of their, their biological variation and the environment in which they found themselves. And this is a checklist. And all of these are important uh, to me in one way or the other, but the ones that were particularly important were the ones that dealt with reproduction, oops, with reproduction, and this isn't gonna work, okay. Reproduction, nutrition, growth, and development. I like effective functioning, you just have to feel good, all right? Um, 
physical performance in particular, which you'll see we, we really doubt a good bit on, and then the nervous system functioning and intellectual ability. So these were kind of a, a, a inventory of places where you could develop your understanding of whether population is benefiting to certain areas of biological variation. That was in 1975. In 1976, the World Food and Nutrition Study was issued by the uh, Food and Nutrition Board and the National Academy of Sciences, commissioned by Congress. And they, were, they wrote in their report where they thought that nutrition research, especially international nutrition research that should be focused on problems in developing countries, should be focused. And you'll see what I underlined here in red, where it's need to determine the consequences of low level of nutrition. And they didn't say clinical nutrition, they just said low levels of nutrition, which gave you a broad range of variation in suboptimal nutrition. And how do these relate to work performance, uh, infection, physical and mental growth and development, uh, job performance, pregnancy, lactation, fertility, family planning. It kind of sounded like Mazes' checklist to me. But now this has been kind of codified into the nutrition literature. This is how we should be evaluating nutrition interventions or nutritional status relative to these kinds of outcomes. Functional outcomes, as I'll call them from here on out. So that kind of set me in motion to deal with how to start integrating my research at high altitude into what was uh, going on in the nutrition world at the time. Uh, but to do that, I realized I needed another discipline, and that was epidemiology. Because I needed to understand how to systematically relate the environment to the biology or the environment to health or the environment to nutritional status. And I was, I kind of learned epidemiology uh, while I was doing my, my graduate work, but it was never called that. It was community research or community uh, anthropology or whatever. But, uh, so I had some of the tools, but I didn't really have a, a very formal training in it. But uh, that was very clear that that was where I needed to bring in some additional expertise and training in myself. And uh, it was uh, not, epidemiology was not a strong component of the curriculum or the faculty for that matter at Cornell in 1977. But in 1977, I was fortunate, Jean Pierre's not here, is he? No. I had a great mentor. So how did I use this epidemiology? Well, this is one example. We're still working in high altitude. We're still interested in the physical stresses or physiological stresses that were induced by living at extreme high altitudes. We're talking about uh, altitudes of about uh, 4,000 meters, about 1,300 to 13,000, 14,000 feet above sea level. And we worked, a lot of this research was done in Bolivia. And this is just one example of a study that we had done in uh, looking at birth weight at high altitude. It's been long known that, that high altitude babies are smaller than low altitude babies. And we confirmed that in Bolivia, there's about a 350 gram difference in the birth weight. And the uh, assumption was that these smaller babies, because there are a lot more of them at high altitude, are going to suffer from uh, a greater degree of morbidity, mortality that's associated with low birth weight. So the, we, we know that smaller, and today, that smaller newborns have a higher risk of dying in the neonatal period. And they establish themselves, that, that risk establishes itself, and I'm not going to get this, with that reverse J-shaped curve. You can see that the mortality risk increased precipitously at uh, birth weights below about 2,500 grams, and it actually goes up a little bit at the other end, but uh, we're not going to talk about that today. Now that was common knowledge, but we didn't know how mortality played out along this birth weight continuum. Uh, so we collected data in, on 10,000 births in, in La Paz and about 13,000 births in Santa Cruz at low altitude in Bolivia, and we looked at the mortality data related to that. And we found that they really didn't superimpose, that there were two separate curves. Now at high altitude, the babies are smaller. At high altitude, the babies are also 
primarily delivered to indigenous women. They are uh, generally very poor, have poor nutritional status, poor prenatal care. At Low Aldo in Santa Cruz, it was assumed that the babies were, where there were still very poor populations down there, but a lot more of the, of, uh, the middle class is living in Santa Cruz. So you expect bigger babies down low altitude. If altitude were not a, a factor, they'd still be bigger, and you would have lower mortality risk in general. Well, in fact, what we found is that the same birth weight, and we'll take 2,500 grams, which is kind of the universally accepted value for low birth weight, we found that the mortality risk in low altitude was about 25 deaths per thousand live births. But at high altitude, at the same weight, it was only, I believe it's nine there, or eight. Eight deaths per thousand live births. So things were just totally reversed from what we thought. We knew the babies would be smaller, but we figured they would carry at least as high a mortality risk for their birth weight compared to low altitude. In fact, they had one-third the risk, at least at 2,500 grams. So what did this tell us? Well, this suggested that, that we, our interpretation is that maybe the causes of low birth weight were not as pathogenic at high altitude as they were at low altitude. They were due primarily to hypoxia, or the reduced oxygen in the environment that is associated with, with uh, you know, the air you breathe and contributes to hypoxemia in the mother. And apparently the smaller babies that come from hypoxemic mothers are not at the same risk as babies of the same size that are born to non-hypoxic mothers who must have had some other cause of their low birth weight. All right? So that was one of the very early features of looking at functional consequences of a morphological characteristic or something we often use as a measure of, of nutritional status, which is low birth weight. Okay? So still working at high altitude, we then moved on to some other questions where I thought, okay, let me start getting more integrated into nutrition. And, one of, and I asked myself, what would be the limiting nutritional uh, situation at high altitude in terms of conferring an advantage to somebody who had to adapt to the hypoxia of this environment, this reduced oxygen tension. How many of you have ever been at altitudes above, let's say, 10,000 feet? Most of you, all right? What happens when you get up there? It's hard to run, right? <laughs> It's hard to breathe in general. It's, I mean, the air, if you go up to 13,000 feet, 13,500 feet in La Paz, you have uh, the oxygen tension is about, one, about two thirds of what you see at sea level. It's almost like saying for every, uh, every three breaths you take at sea level, you can only allow to take two breaths at high altitude. It's that kind of a thing. It really does create a stress. Physiologically, fortunately, we're pretty adaptable and we can adapt to that. And one of the major ways in which you or I will adapt, and, and in fact, much of the Indian population will adapt, is to increase our hemoglobin. So hemoglobins are higher at high altitude, and it's primarily because it has to carry oxygen, but oxygen is being delivered to the lungs at so low, low pressure that the stimulation is to produce more hemoglobin so you can carry more oxygen. There's a cost to that. And I was thinking, well, what's a nutritional cost? Well, what if you're iron deficient at high altitude? What if you're anemic at high altitude, whatever that might mean? Is that going to impair your ability to adapt? So we started this journey, which was 30 some years ago, of looking at iron, stimulated by my question about what is a nutrition factor that might limit your ability to adapt to high altitude? And iron, as you'll see, has been a theme for most of the, much of the research since then. Okay, so what do we show? Well, this was just an example. It shows you the increase in hemoglobin with altitude. This is a paper we published about uh, 20 years ago that uh, shows that there is this increasing level of, uh, of uh, hemoglobin. And this was primarily published to provide correction factors for people who were evaluating hemoglobins at different altitudes in the Andes to determine what's your criteria for anemia. Your criteria for, these are for pregnant women and, and women of reproductive age. And you know, at sea level is about 120 grams per liter, but at high altitude, because of the stimulation for more hemoglobin production, should anemia be a, a, a different number? And this shows you the relationship for those cutoff points. But so what? So hemoglobin is higher. But functionally, what does it mean if you don't increase your hemoglobin? 
So we did a study in the, in the early 90s or early 80s that looked at the relationship between hemoglobin in, at high altitude and the ability, ability to do physical work. And this was done in, in adult men in La Paz, Bolivia, again at about 13,500 feet above sea level. And you can see here, this is just one of several studies we had done, but this is the simplest one that just shows you as hemoglobin increases at high altitude, your ability to do work measured by this exercise test. This, this is a measure of what we call VO2 max, or the uh, amount of work, uh, oxygen consumption in this case at 150 beats per minute. And you can see this positive relationship. And this has been replicated many times. So now we have not just, a, we have a, a nutrition measure, hemoglobin. Tells you something about anemia. But, like the low birth weight issue, what do you define anemia at high altitude? And is there a relationship that can be inferred from some of these functional measures, like their ability to do physical work? or the ability to transport oxygen to the working tissues. And this then allowed us to confirm some of these cutoff points that we have for anemia and high altitude. But it was one of the first studies that we had done uh, on using physical work capacity as a metric for looking at the functional consequences of a nutrition indicator. And that was the, the uh, anemia uh, uh, iron hemoglobin uh, issue. This brought me into the fourth discipline because we were looking at physical performance, I needed to make sure that we were doing that properly. And I had some training in that at Penn State from uh, Ellsworth Buzzkirk, who was a very well-known applied exercise physiologist. Uh, he had been president of the American Physiological Society, and, uh, and he had also worked at high altitude. And he, uh, tr I think, trained me pr pretty well for what I was going to use later on, although at the time I got as a, gra a graduate student, I had no idea I'd ever use it. But it was one of those uh, bits of knowledge you tuck away and somewhere it emerges as something important later on. And you'll see there's one other case of that in this journey as well. So it was a matter of being trained, but not having done the actual research. Until one of my, until my very first PhD student came along, and that was John Beard who uh, was interested in iron, is interested in altitude, although his doctoral dissertation was not on iron and, and uh, work capacity. He was looking at anemia in a clinical setting. We then continued a 30-year collaboration, looking at the relationships between a number of different nutritional parameters and work capacity, physical work capacity. And John really dug into the physiology literature and provided me with kind of my right hand guidance to interpreting the physical, the physical work capacity type of literature, and uh, then he continued to use some of that later on in his career. Uh, now, how do we use that? Well, the first place we used it outside of high altitude was in Guatemala. And I had the good fortune in, in the mid-1980s to uh, collaborate on a, an important follow-up study of an intervention that was conducted in Guatemala in the late 60s and early 70s. Many of you may have heard of the INCAP studies. These were studies that were conducted uh, through the Institute of Nutrition for Central America and Panama on uh, co uh, several cohorts of uh, starting with pregnant women and then following their infants through to about four to five years of age. Uh, Jean-Pierre Havik was involved in that in the early days before he came to Cornell. And as you'll see, a number of the collaborators in that project continue to be my collaborators today. Uh, but the, this was an intervention that gave a, 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 a nutritional drink in the form of what we call a tole, which has a high protein and high energy content, starting in pregnancy and then feeding it to infants once they were weaned and or a fresco, which was a low pro or no protein, low energy kind of control drink. This study lasted for about 10 years, eight years, finished in 1977, showed some really important results in terms of how nutrition during pregnancy and early life affects physical growth, how it affects co cognitive and mental development, but then it stopped. Well, 10 years later, we were asking ourselves, whatever happened to those children? Did that intervention have a lasting effect? So we were able to get money from the uh, NIH to go back and restudy those same subjects. And we were able to find about three quarters of them still living in the villages. 
and we followed them up with a whole series of, of characteristics that we wanted that we thought might be impacted by this this intervention. Now, this is a protein energy intervention. It was not iron at that point. And one of the things that I was asked to look at, among a few others, was their physical work capacity. So we developed some tests that could be used uh, for these subjects. Uh, we used, it was a treadmill test. We measured maximum oxygen uptake, similar to what we did in, in, in uh, Bolivia. And what we found on the, on the panel on the left, you see that the, the atole is a high protein supplement and the fresco is a, is a control. <coughs> these kids were measured between about 12 and 16 years of age. The intervention stopped when most of them were about five years of age. So there was a, a, almost a 10 year gap where there's no intervention. And the question is, was there a long lasting effect? Well, indeed, those who received the, the atole who benefit, shown to be benefiting early in life, also benefited even 10 years later. They had higher work capacities than did those who were in the fresco group, but only in males. We did not see it in females. And I think you'll see this is another recurring theme in some of our other studies that we've done more recently. Uh, part of this is probably very much social, in terms of social pressures for what adolescent girls are expected to do. It affects their physical fitness they're much less active in Guatemala than, than you might expect uh, an American teenager, at least at this time. But the boys weren't constrained by that. In fact, they were encouraged to be more active. And there's probably some physical activity component of this that, n that needed to be understood. So that was using the work capacity as a functional measure of the outcome of a nutrition intervention that occurred many, many years earlier. I might add, this was the start of the follow-up studies. And there have been at least five cycles of follow-up studies for this, these cohorts. Some of these individuals are approaching 50 years of age. And they're an ideal population to look at the effects of early nutrition on later adult characteristics of performance, even chronic disease like heart disease, diabetes, and so on. And now we're also, obviously, long-term mortality. John Hodnott, who I don't think is here today, has actually published on some of this with some of our, our colleagues. And several of our PhD students have worked in this pop, these follow-up studies as well. Lynette Neufeld, who was here a couple weeks ago, and uh, Sonia Hernandez both did their doctoral thesis from the follow-ups of, these, of these, uh, this cohort. All right, so what did uh, these studies provided? They provided, uh, uh, really, they were milestone studies in human nutrition. Not only the original INCAP study, but they continue to be contributing to important knowledge in nutrition, even as, as the cohort ages and they're going through different stages of life. Um, mostly as an outcome of understanding how nutrition interventions affect what we call human capital. The formation of characteristics or uh, functions, behaviors in individuals that are important for their everyday life, including work capacity. And as you'll see, also things like cognitive function as well. Uh, it also, they allowed me to continue to explore these functional consequences uh, on iron deficiency. We did collect data on iron in this population in addition to their, their protein energy status. So it kind of reinforced those early studies that we had on iron. And these studies also introduced me to the effects of malnutrition on cognitive function. Although I didn't know at the time, it's another one, th another one of those things where you kind of learn it, you store it, and then 20 years later it comes out and says, wouldn't it be interesting to look at cognitive function in some of our other pro pro projects we've done more recently? The uh, um, other thing I should footnote to this, I should add, is that it, cognitive function and nutrition wasn't totally new to me. When I actually arrived here to teach, my very first course that I taught for 35 years was taught in a joint course in human development called Human Growth and Development from a Biological and Behavioral Perspective. And I initially taught it with Henry Ricciuti, who was a developmental psychologist. And then when Henry retired, Steve Robertson, who's currently in the faculty, join me to continue to teach the course. So I continue to get, by osmosis, the importance of cognition and child development and behavior uh, as we were putting together this course and looking at some of the relationships between biology and behavior. So uh, this also brought me in contact with some co collaborators I've had for ever since. 
Uh, this was actually a picture, I don't know if you can recognize these people, you, know, you, you, may, you may know the person on the left, uh, but how about the two on the right? Juan and Ray, right. <laughs> uh, Juan Rivera and Ray Martorell were, uh, Ray was one of our, our collaborators on that INCAP follow-up study. Juan had just finished his PhD thesis here with Jean-Pierre and was looking for a job probably didn't have to look very far. We were actually looking for one, and we hired him to run the project in Guatemala. And uh, Juan has since moved on to become the director of nutrition and health at the Institute of Public Health in, in, in Mexico, his native Mexico. And of course, Reynaldo, many of you know if you're in the international nutrition community. The other person who was brought into this, again, I'll bring the slide, the cognition in here, was Ernesto Pollitt. Now, Ernesto was a developmental psychologist. He was one of the early proponents of studying the effects of nutrition on behavior, behavioral development in children in particular. And uh, he was brought in to do a, a lot of the behavioral testing for this cohort that we had followed through their teen years. He had been a little bit involved in their initial data collection when they were young infants, but only in analyzing the data, not collecting it. Because he was a graduate student here at Cornell at the time. He got his PhD at Cornell with Henry Ricciuti. So there was still this Cornell connection. And Ernesto is now retired from UC Davis, but he's still writing and, and, and making contributions. So, pardon? You don't know who that is? That's Sharon. Yeah, yeah, that's my wife, right? Uh, we were all younger then. This is actually uh, 19... 88 is the batic I had done at Stanford when Ronaldo was on the faculty at Stanford. And we're probably standing in front of a winery someplace in Napa Valley. So. <laughs> okay, so this now was moving me more and more into iron deficiency as a component of, of nutritional status that I really wanted to understand a lot more about. And uh, it became pretty clear that research needed to be done on a number of different areas to move this question ahead. One is we had to be able to, we had to be more careful about how we defined iron deficiency and also how we define work capacity. And it's, been, it's pretty clear to all of us today and even back then, uh, I mean most people who were working in iron were fully aware of the fact that iron deficiency does not mean anemia. And by the same token, anemia does not necessarily mean iron deficiency. This is your, they're not one and one. And that was an important distinction to be made because uh, anemia is a very severe form of iron deficiency, but not all anemia is caused by iron deficiency. Iron deficiency in its less severe form that doesn't quite lead to anemia may still have some physiological repercussions. And that's one I was particularly interested in because it was kind of hidden. If you weren't, weren't anemic, you were normal. And I thought that there might be more to it than that. Uh, the, also, from the work capacity's point of view, the most common work capacity test that was done was a, what we call a VO2 max test. This is a really strenuous test. Have any of you ever done a VO2 max test? OK, and live to tell, right? <laughs> um, you put somebody on a treadmill or on a stationary bicycle and you basically keep cranking up the workload until they can't go any further. I mean, literally, you're exhausted at the end of this test. And then you have to go further because you want to get to a super max level to confirm that you were actually at max. About the only people that can do this are, are kids who seem to take it as a challenge and athletes. And occasionally somebody who may be not a competitive athlete but very, very active physically. The, so it's a very difficult test to administer, but also it's questionable what it really means in the context of a functional test. Very few people that we study in developing countries do any kind of work at this maximum level. They're working at sub-maximal level. Now it does tell you something about the overall efficiency of the oxygen transport system, but it doesn't tell you about met metabolic efficiencies that, that may occur at lower levels of exertion. So we wanted to reevaluate this thing we called work capacity and come up with something that might be a little bit more relevant to, to the everyday life of people in developing countries. And also, again, we started 
kind of dabbling or thinking about some of these ideas about cognitive function. Uh, and this came out of a, um, a workshop that David Levitsky, Ernesto Pollitt, and I had put together in Geneva in, in, uh, uh, in 1988 to try and understand how does iron affect behavior. And uh, we published a few things on that, but it was more theoretical, and then I kind of pushed that aside and continued to work on work capacity. All right, you don't need to see this. This just shows you that anemia is not iron deficiency. Iron deficiency is not anemia. But there is this thing where they overlap called iron deficiency anemia. We were interested very much in what happens in that blue circle, not necessarily what happened in the, in the orange circle or the, the overlapping circle, of course, was important. Um, so, what were the different consequences of iron deficiency? Uh, and what do we find from our early studies? Well, our early studies were done in the laboratory here at, at Cornell. And the first thing we found was that severe iron deficiency causes anemia, which reduces blood capacity to carry oxygen to the working muscles. And this has also compromised the, the conversion of that money, that, and that those uh, substrates into energy to be used at the tissue level. VO2 max is very much constrained by hemoglobin. It's probably, other than people with respiratory disease, that's probably the single most important predictor of how well you'll do on a VO2 max test. Other than, well, there are things like training and so on if you're an athlete. But we also were interested in the less severe forms of iron deficiency. And these were shown in our laboratory to, actually it's pretty easy to find it in a population. We were surprised. Uh, 25 to 30 percent of Cornell women that, that we recruited for a number of studies were iron deficient, but only about 2 to 3 percent were anemic. So there's a lot of iron deficiency out there without much anemia. And we found that in those individuals, their VO2 max was not necessarily compromised because they weren't anemic. They were normal. But their iron deficiency did seem to affect their ability to do physical work nonetheless, but it was not in these VO2 max tests, it was on a sub-maximal type of test that measures the efficiency with which the muscles do work. So we had a different measure of work capacity than, than the traditional one that we thought we should be exploring, which is uh, something that we ended up calling energetic efficiency, for lack of a better term at the time. So there are the two levels of iron deficiency have different repercussions in terms of the functional outcomes. Um, a number of these studies uh, that we did here at Cornell and then took into the field in the laboratory were done by graduate students. The first one was by Isabel Zhu, who uh, uh, did her doctoral thesis with Cornell women looking at, who are not anemic but iron deficient, and looking at the effects on their efficiency of doing work and confirm some of what I just showed you in the previous graph. And the other was Tom Brutzart, who was a PhD student with me. Uh, and he did his doctoral dissertation on energetic efficiency in women in Bolivia who were doing work, and then applied that also to a group of, of women that we studied in Mexico while he was a postdoc. All of them confirming the differential responses to iron depending on where you are along that continuum regard to work capacity. Okay, so this would allowed us to develop this kind of conceptual map. And this is pretty straightforward. This is where the conventional wisdom was. That depleted iron stores led to functional iron deficiency, which led to anemia, reduced oxygen transport, and affected a whole series of, of metabolic responses related to work. The most important would have been maximum power output, or VO2 max, but also it's thought that it affected endurance and it affects energetic efficiency. But what was not clear at that point is that you could have a functional iron deficiency that has not yet led to anemia and might be affecting the oxidative capacity of the tissues of cells to actually generate or convert uh, substrates into energy for the bu muscles to work. And this is more or less supported by the research that we had done in the laboratories. So, uh, how do we test this? Well, we went to Mexico and we had shown that, in fact, at a relatively modest workload, 60 watts on a stationary bicycle, we took women who were iron deficient, we gave them either iron capsule or a placebo. They were not anemic, they just had low ferritins. And we found after six weeks of supplementation that the ability to do work at 60 watts, which was measured by the oxygen consumed to do that work, 
actually reduced significantly in the women who got the iron, but not in the women that received the placebo. In other words, they were doing the same amount of work at a lower energy cost. They were more efficient. Uh, and this is a kind of a cartoon that, tries, that I tried to put together to explain this phenomena. Uh, basically, it shows you that work input and work output are related that we were always with VO2 max tests or the energetic efficiency test looking at work output, but you, ha you can't ignore work input. And you have uh, iron deficient uh, individuals whose slope in that relationship is not the same as a healthy individual. And the implications of that is that a given work output, a given amount of, produ of, of production of, of some kind of effort, and it could be on an ergometer or a treadmill, or it could be, as you'll see, picking tea in a tea estate. At that same level of output, you find <coughs> that the iron deficient individuals require more energy to do the same amount of work. Or the, rever the other way of looking at it is that at the same amount of, of work input, same energy expenditure, the malnourished or iron deficient individual is producing less. So we use this as our guide for trying to justify rolling out these ideas that we developed in the laboratory into real life situations. And the challenge there was how do you measure productivity? Or how do you measure the work output if you don't have a laboratory? So we, uh, we looked at a number of different opportunities to test this where we thought that the output should, could be some measure of worker productivity. How much they earned or how much how much earth they moved in a work in a in a, uh, a road crew, how much rubber they might have tapped if they're rubber tappers or whatever, and there's a number of studies that had been done to look at these different kinds of productivity measures, but they were all focused on iron deficiency anemia, and we thought that the under that, that what we didn't know was what happens in those who are not anemic but were still iron deficient, because the laboratory tests suggested that they were also less efficient metabolically or, or muscularly. So we, uh, we thought, well, we, had, we wanted to study this beyond the iron deficient anemic uh, situation, which, by the way, if you look at, at prevalences of anemia versus prevalence of iron deficiency measured by low ferritin, there are about twice as many people who are iron deficient as there are people who are anemic in most populations. So it's a bigger problem than just saying, well, it's just a little bit of a tail of that distribution. So how are we going to do this? Well, we needed to find a work task that uh, we could quantify, an output, a productivity. We needed to work uh, that was performed by iron deficient laborers. In no sense in doing this in people who aren't iron deficient. And in fact, much of the work that had been done before had been done in men, where the risk of iron deficiency was much lower than it is in women. So women became the, the topic here of uh, our studies or our subjects. And we needed a study design that could infer causality. In other words, we needed an intervention that followed the kind of randomized controlled trial uh, requirements of, uh, of uh, causality. So the solution was female tea pickers uh, who lived in northeastern India. They randomized uh, to control, uh, we needed a randomized control intervention trial. We had one that was offered that we, uh, we thought we could provide them with some insight not only to whether the randomized trial, which was an intervention with iron, could improve iron status, but could it also uh, improve things like productivity. And we ended up doing this study on double fortified salt which uh, was developed uh, in India with the help of the Micronutrient Initiative in Canada. And uh, the study site was in extreme northeastern India. You can see that little, what they call the gooseneck up there. Uh, that's in Darjeeling district where some of the best tea in the world is grown. Uh, and we, uh, we had two treatments, a double fortified salt and, and a iodized salt. The double fortified salt had iodine and iron. The iodized salt just had iodine. And they were randomized, uh, consumed for four months or for ten months. We had the usual iron status measures that would have been required for any kind of efficacy study. But what we did was added these functional outcomes, which was not r regularly done in these kinds of interventions. It was enough just to show that you improved iron status. But how about improving 
a battery of functional outcomes. And some of those there you see productivity, which is the amount of T they picked, was a good metric because they get paid by the weight of T that they pick. So they had incentive to work hard to, to pick the T. And uh, it's only, they have to work hard enough to actually induce some of these, these physiological responses that were important. We also uh, looked at the bottom at cognitive function, which was a new thing for us. That thing from 20 years ago was coming home to, to roost at this point. The results are just summarized in this graph. Basically, we showed some improvement in all the measures of iron status. And uh, this is just total body iron. Uh, didn't matter whether you looked at the total population, you looked only at anemics, you looked at, uh, at iron deficient anemics, or you looked at iron deficients who were not anemia, that, that bar at the far right. The only place you didn't find it, be significant, were in those who were neither iron deficient nor anemic, which is what you would expect. And we then turned our attention to looking at productivity, and for there, it wasn't enough to just say how much tea are they picking. We wanted to know, based on that cartoon I showed you, how much work are they actually doing to, uh, in terms of physiological work to produce that much tea? So we had to measure their energy expenditure while they were working, while they were plucking tea. And this is just a mechanism that we use for doing that using a uh, indirect uh, calorimetry and, uh, and measuring respiratory gases to infer the amount of effort or energy that was expended. We're still working on these data. Of course, as interventions in the real world go uh, this was not a perfect timing. Things happened at end line that were different than we expected. But we're, we're still trying to come up with this measure of work efficiency, which we can do, but then to put it to the test of the intervention and see whether it made a difference. The other thing that we did, however, that we brought into this was the cognitive function measures. And uh, this brought in yet my fifth discipline, were these cognitive scientists, cognitive neuroscientists. And in particular, John Beard again appeared because he had now had been moving into areas that looked at how did iron get into the brain, what does it do in the brain, where does it go to the brain when you have a deficiency, uh, where is it depleted, mostly with animal models. He kind of laid out the, the mechanisms. And then Michael Wenger, who was at the time a, a professor in the psychology department at Penn State, was uh, developing some rather novel ways of measuring very specific cognitive functions, not using the, a test you take off the shelf, but some that really may have some functional measures that are important on everyday life. And then Laura Murray Kolb, Penn, who also is at Penn State, was able to adapt some of Wenger's models to measure in populations in developing countries. Uh, the thread here is important because John and Wenger had collaborated, and John was going to work with us in the in the study in Darjeeling, and unfortunately he died before we got into the field. But Michael was able to come in and help us out, and Laura was John Beard's last PhD student at Penn State. So the, uh, the uh, legacy of John still lives. Uh, what do we see? This is just one result. And these are results that blew everybody away when they were presented at ASN a couple years ago. This is just one of many tests that were done. They all show very similar kinds of results. The outcome here is a simple reaction time. On a, this is a test done on a computer screen. And all you had to do is you see an image. As soon as you see the image, you pressed a button. So it's just looking at the time it takes to react to that stimulus. And you can see at baseline, the iodized salt and the double fortified salt were the same. It's before intervention. After 10 months of intervention, the iodized salt group did not change, whereas the, in the intervention group, the double fortified salt, had a significant reduction in the reaction time. They were much faster at responding after 10 months of intervention. And many of our other cognitive measures showed similar kinds of results. All right, so that took us to the next series of studies. And I'm afraid I'm running out of time. I don't know if you want me to go on. You certainly are welcome to leave. But uh, I won't feel offended. But I can tell you a little bit more about the next series of studies, which is really what we're doing now, which is the studies using a different kind of intervention. Rather than using double fortified salt, which is a commercially processed uh, product to get iron into the food supply, we started working with a group 
that was interested in what we call biofortification. And that is using the sciences of agriculture, mostly plant breeding and agronomy and soil sciences, and to some degree also economics, to introduce micronutrients into staple food crops, usually through plant breeding, that would be sustainable, low cost, and be able to uh, presumably show an improvement in the nutritional status. And the three nutrients that were chosen were uh, the plant breeders felt they could manipulate most was iron, zinc, and beta carotene, or preformed vitamin A. We're fortunate that Jan Lowe is here in the front, and you can tell that she is a beta carotene person because she always wears orange. <laughs> and she worked with the orange flesh sweet potato projects around the world, but mostly in East Africa. So I'm glad that you're here. So if you want to leave, this is your chance to do it, and I will continue to tell you a little bit more about some of the work that we're doing. I won't even look, okay? Are there, is, there, is there another class coming in here? No. No? Okay. Okay, so we wanted an intervention that would be also uh, amenable to the kind of efficacy studies we were doing with the double fortified salt, a randomized control trial to look at causality, but would be also amenable to putting in the functional outcomes of, uh, of the intervention associated with iron, in addition to just the blood biomarkers of iron. And uh, we were fortunate to team up with a group called Harvest Plus, who uh, were part of the CGIAR system at IFPRI, uh, and we were able to do studies in three different locations in Mexico, India, and Rwanda, all with biofortified crops. And uh, the CGIAR, just to go over this quickly, has really been the, 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 the people behind getting biofortification as a strategy uh, off the ground. And uh, the project is housed at IFPRI, it also has a uh, part of them are at SEAT, which is in Cali, Colombia, uh, and the real person behind it is Howie Buis. And Howie's been here to visit us several times, but uh, it was his idea to try and operationalize this concept of how could you harness agricultural sciences to improve micronutrient nutrition. And he did this primarily by working with plant breeders. And these are three of the plant breeders that we worked with because we work with three different crops. The first was uh, in, with rice in the International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines, Glenn Gregorio. And then uh, we later worked with uh, Steve Beebe, uh, who developed beans at SEAT in Cali, Colombia, uh, that we used in Mexico and then later used in Rwanda, a different kind of bean. And then finally, Katarai, who is at ICRASAT in, in India, who developed the high iron versions of pearl millet that we used. And then what we did is to take what they developed in the fields and feed them in human feeding trials uh, to look at the efficacy. But we were able to also add on these functional outcomes in the studies other than just looking at the blood biomarkers. Um, this just basically gives you an idea of how, of how we put all of this together uh, and the importance of using a sustainable approach through the food system was very attractive plus the ability to include functional measures and to use a randomized control trial as a way of looking at causality. The first study we did uh, that I want to show you where we actually used the functional measures of work capacity and cognitive function was in India with uh, pearl millet. And the pearl millet studies were done in, in young adolescents, boarding school uh, children, boys and girls, uh, and they were 44% iron deficient, 29% anemic. So they're a good population to study. We had about 250 of them that we randomly assigned to receive either high, pearl, high iron pearl millet or control pearl millet, which still has iron, but just the high iron pearl millet had three times as much iron as the control. And we fed it to them in the form of a flatbread. You can see the, the woman there, the girl there is handing out the flatbread to, to the students uh, at their lunch hour. Uh, what do we find? Well, we saw that uh, after uh, six months of consuming, or actually this is four months of consuming high iron pearl millet uh, in the form of a flatbread, you had a significant improvement in ferritin and significant improvement in body iron. Not much change in, in hemoglobin. In fact, 
it looks like it went down. It really didn't change. But remember, there's only 29% anemia in this population, but 44% iron deficiency. So you expect the iron measured, like ferritin, to respond more than perhaps the hemoglobin. So then we did the first of our exercise tests here. And we did two types of tests. One was a VO2 max test, and the other was an energetic efficiency test. And you can see here that in the uh, VO2 max test, there was not a significant difference. But the important thing here is VO2 maxes went down after, after six months. Th and this ended up being a, a characteristic of a study we did in Rwanda as well. These students become less active as the school year goes on. And their fitness levels go down. So the question is, does iron attenuate that decline? And it looks like it might, but it's not statistically significant. But where, to, where you do see an effect is in the energetic efficiency. That you see the, the high iron group, biofortified group, had an improvement in their efficiency, whereas the, the uh, control group had somewhat of a decline. The difference between the two was significant. And just to follow up on the VO2 max, remember back to our Guatemala studies, we did see the effects in VO2 max, but it was only in the boys. The girls were the ones who became the, the least active during the school year, and the boys apparently benefited from the extra iron by improving their VO2 max. So then uh, we looked at the cognitive tests, and this is just, again, a reaction time test, analyzed slightly differently than the one I showed before. This is in terms of the amount of iron consumed from the pearl millet. So the, the Q1 is the first quartile. Those, those are primarily controls. The Q4 are those on the high iron side. They're, they're the ones getting the high iron pearl millet. And you can see that the reaction time significantly reduces in the, those who consume the most pearl millet or the most iron from pearl millet compared to the, the Q1 or the lower quartile. Uh, the uh, same analysis is also subjected to a type of path analysis to show that indeed the treatment effect was mediated through changes in ferritin. So it was a change in iron status, not just something associated with the intervention uh, other than the change in iron status. Uh, we also measured uh, uh, for the first time uh, in this population electroencephalograms to look at neurological function. Uh, those results are just now coming in. And then we moved on to a second study. And this is the last one I'll tell you about. This was in Rwanda. We just finished this not too long ago. These were in university women. 86% uh, were iron deficient, 37% were anemic, but they were chosen for that. We screened 1,000 women to find women, uh, 286 I think it was, who had ferritins less than 20. And we wanted a group that was likely to respond. And we found about 27% iron deficiency, but they're the ones that were the subjects in the study. They lived on campus at the National University of Rwanda. And uh, Rwanda is a very, very small country in the middle of a very big continent. Uh, and we worked in, you can see in the little circle on the bottom, in Butari, which is where the University of Rwanda at Hue is located. Um, and we fed them beans in the form of biofortified beans or a control bean. Again, even control beans have a lot of iron. Biofortified beans had twice as much. We fed them for approximately 126 days, or exactly 126 days, and looked at their, um, their biological response in terms of iron status, as well as the same kind of physical measures we used in India. They were fed in a cafeteria. It was all randomized and controlled, and with very good controls over how much they eat. We knew precisely how much beans these women were eating for the entire four or four and a half months of the study. We weighed everything. And uh, what did we find? Well, we found that indeed all of the measures of iron status, whether it's hemoglobin, ferritin, especially if it's log because of its distribution, and body iron, all significantly improved in those who received the biofortified beans. Uh, even the hemoglobin improved. But remember, there's more anemia in this group than there was in the previous studies. And we have reason to believe that most of that anemia was actually due to iron deficiency. Then we did the physical performance test on the same subjects. And if you, three weeks ago, you went to the field seminar, you heard Sarah Luna present these results as part of her doctoral dissertation. And what did she find? Well, she found again, or after four and a half months, in these women, their VO2 max has dropped. It dropped a good bit. So we have three studies where the women just don't seem to improve their VO2 maxes during the study. 
But what did happen is that the, those who received the biofortified beans attenuated that drop. They did not drop as much. And no matter how you present the VO2 max data, uh, it still shows an effect. What we did not see, however, is any effect on efficiency, which we thought we would see. We saw it in, in India. We did not see it in this population. And we're still exploring that. But we have some reason to believe that uh, part of it has to do with the way you measure efficiency on a stationary bicycle in a population that's not used to riding bicycles. No. OK. And we also did cognitive tests on them. And we're still waiting to hear the results of that from Michael Wenger, who's doing the analysis with the EEG data. So I'm not done. I'm almost done with this, but I'm not done doing research. We still want to follow up on a lot of this. We still have to complete some of the analysis. But I want to start looking now more at how you link these tests that we did in the field to real life functional outcomes that are important to everyday life. And eventually, to be able to use this kind of information and quantify it to facilitate the benefit cost analyses that are necessary to determine whether something like biofortification is a worthwhile intervention. We have pretty good ideas of cost, but the benefits are generally how many grams of hemoglobin have you increased? And we think we can do better than that by saying, well, how much do you improve their, their cognitive function? How much do you improve their ability to do physical work? And I can reflect on this in closing that you know, my anthropological training, I think, set me up for this 40-year ride, 45-year ride. Uh, to allow me to look at a number of these different questions from a multidisciplinary perspective, uh, and then focus it on the problems of malnutrition. Uh, it's taken me to incredible places. I work with incredible people, the students here at Cornell and elsewhere, my colleagues, and of course, people in the private and public sector. Uh, you know, I look at all these different disciplines that I mentioned that we brought in. And one could ask the question, in fact, I think somebody did ask me this question when I was way back early in my career, when I was thinking about some of these things, about aren't you spreading yourself too thin? So you can ask, does this, is, does this make me a jack of all trades and a master of none? Well, that's an open question for you know, the rest of the scientific community. But I can tell you one thing, it certainly made the journey a lot more fun. And keep in mind, when you're thinking about interdisciplinary studies or interdisciplinary work that most of the scientific advances today are not embedded within a discipline as they might have been 50 years ago or 75 years ago. Most of the real action is at the peripheries of this discipline where they are interacting with other disciplines, the multidisciplinary boundaries. And I was very fortunate to be allowed at Cornell to, to explore those boundaries and bring people in from a number of different places to answer some questions that I thought were important. So for that, I'm grateful to a lot of people, including, the, of course, the institutions I worked with and all the graduate students and postdocs that I worked with. And of course, <laughs> the most important. I'm sorry I took you too long on this journey, but I do appreciate your staying a little bit longer. Oh, you yourself to have a lot of stamina, so if anyone wants to leave, you can. Anyone wants to ask some questions, Jerry's willing, willing to stay. We need some iron, though. Yeah. Some iron. Yeah. Some iron. Yes, Paul. A question about your first data slide where you showed mortality versus birth weight in La Paz versus Santa Cruz. I'm just wondering if there are differences in the population structures or could be founder effects as people populated the high altitude zones that are in Well, in fact, we, that was what we were out to study in the first place. We were under the assumption that populations that lived at high altitude, the indigenous population, were better adapted to the high altitude because they had lived there for five to 10,000 years. And there was a possibility, not necessarily a founder effect, maybe that's how the genetic variation arrived, but it could have been due to natural selection. And one reason we looked at pregnancy is because we thought if natural selection is operating anywhere, it's probably very early in life, during pregnancy in the first few weeks or months after delivery. So it may be that, like I said, there, there may, this tells us that there may be different causes of variation in low birth weight but the, uh, at high altitude compared to low altitude. But the consequences of that low birth weight are very different. And it may be that the smaller babies you see at high altitude are not uh, caused by the, the kinds of factors that you see at, at low altitude. The high altitude babies have a, 
are primarily due to hypoxia during pregnancy. And that may not be as pathogenic. And it may be that this population can tolerate smaller babies, or at least the babies can tolerate being small for at least the first, this is in this case, the first month of life. So there is something, we really think that there is something going on genetically here. And this was 35 years ago that we started looking at this. And we fact found that indigenous women, for instance, have bigger babies. Than, and they have different placentas. And they seem to be adapted to the hypoxic environment in ways that the non-indigenous women who were born in, who, who themselves were born and raised in La Paz, but of European ancestry. So there was something going on from the point of view of population differences. And uh, I guess, unfortunately, I, I stopped looking at that after, as I got more involved in nutrition. Yeah. Can I ask a follow-up on that? Is there any significant portion of that high altitude population that moves to low altitude? Yeah. Right, for example, to the city, to in fact, most of that low altitude population that I showed you in Santa Cruz were migrants from high altitude. Ah, I see. Mm -hmm. About half of that population. That was just from hospital records, so you, it's very difficult to determine ethnicity. But we knew from the census that, that about half the population came from high altitude. One more question? Just one more. So in agricultural nutrition, um, there is a lot of interest in biofortification of crops. And, but what you are showing is that not all biofortification of crops has a positive result. That may be partial result. And we still have to figure out how much, how often, and how to do that. Because I think biofortification is a good response for the problems of nutrition in the world. But well, the, the challenge with biofortification in these kinds of studies is unlike, say, commercial fortification, or certainly supplementation studies, is you can't get the dose of iron up to the levels that you would find if you could manipulate through commercial fortification. So you're dealing with the limits of plant breeding, and dealing, if you use conventional plant breeding and not using a, 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 a transgenic approach. So you're getting basically low doses of iron. And we say, you know, it's double the iron content of, of uh, beans. Well, that sounds pretty impressive, except it's only double. And if you, if you gave pills, you could get 10 times more iron into the people in the same period of time, but it's just not sustainable. And I think what we're looking at here is a sustainable long-term intervention that has relatively low cost to the consumer. Most of the cost for development has already been borne by foundations and research institutes. So it's a question now of just getting the seeds out to the people who need it. Well, it's not quite that simple, but the seeds to the people who would normally have grown it, but now they're, they're growing a, a bean, assuming the rest of the inputs. The agronomists still have a lot of work to do in terms of how do you, how do you maximize the genetic potential that might exist in these, in these new lines through other agronomic processes. So it's still, it's still in its infancy in some ways in terms of how you roll these out. In fact, the best examples of rolling it out are the orange flesh sweet potato which uh, Jan has had all this experience with. And part of the advantage you had there is you already had a biofortified product when you started this project 10 years ago, whereas rice and, and beans and pearl millet were only starting to work on the breeding side of things to get the values or the levels high enough to make a difference. And then the social forces, right? Because HMOs, you yeah. don't even mention. Right, well, then the fighting, I mean, one thing Harvest Plus has been fighting ever since they branded the word biofortification is, Region, uh, initially, everybody says, ah, it's a GMO. You know, and it's not a GMO approach. It's a traditional plant breeding approach. Same thing we've been using since 10,000 years ago. Maybe it's a little bit more sophistication. We have more sophisticated tools now than we had then. But nonetheless, it's still conventional plant breeding. Yeah, Jan. Jerry, how did you tackle the length of your feeding trials? If you had to repeat these, uh, are we running up against cost constraints more than anything else? Well, not really. I mean, uh, fortunately, the, we could justify the cost based on how long we had to feed them. But we had to feed them recognizing they had a low dose, and there was a limit to how much they could consume. I mean, these women, the bean study, they consumed 350 grams of beans a day. Cooked beans, 175. And they love beans. And they love beans. But if we tried to do that in a, in a U.S. population, we could never get them to eat that many beans. We did a study with, that I didn't mention with rice, biofortified rice, which is the very first one that we had done. 
And we did that with women who were iron deficient. And the only thing that made that work, other than it took nine months, was that these women ate 600 grams of rice a day. And there wasn't a lot of iron in rice, but if you have enough rice consumed, you make a difference in terms of how much is delivered. So the length of the study is important. And most of these studies, the shortest one we did was actually the bean study. And the part of the reason for that is because they ate so many beans. We could shorten the time. Now these are efficacy studies. This doesn't tell you what's going to happen in real life. It just says, is, it, is there a biological potential for this to work? Then it's up to the people who do who roll these out into the community and do effectiveness studies and overcome all the barriers of adoption and so on that, uh, th to see whether it really makes a difference in the long run. Okay, so let's thank Jerry one more time.